Hello and welcome to Furious Driving. I'm here in Gaydon British Motor Heritage Trust Museum with, well, an awful lot of very exciting cars all around me, but that's not what I'm talking about today. Today we're talking about something which I am particularly fascinated in. I hope you'll enjoy this as well. These are Rover's turbine cars. Now before we get into these cars, here's a quick word from our sponsor and don't forget to like and subscribe and all that kind of stuff. Right now, on with the video. Furious Driving, proud to be supported by Diamond Bright, protecting, cleaning and caring for the Furious fleet and for yours with 10% off using code FD10. Bidding Classics, the online classic car marketplace with more cars added every week. And Lancaster Insurance cover the Furious fleet. They are one of the biggest specialist insurers in the UK covering all areas of vintage to modern classic cars and motorbikes. Follow the links in the description below. So as you may well know, Rover, along with Chrysler, who are the only other big volume manufacturer to have experimented with running a gas turbine as an idea for car propulsion. Well, that's basically it. Only Rover in the UK and Chrysler in America. Everyone else, well, just didn't do it. Rover, though, did actually take it a very long way, ultimately producing jet turbine engines that were used in the Vulcan bomber as its auxiliary power unit. But these are some of the road-going cars that they actually experimented with thinking they could actually replace the petrol engine, the piston engine, with something totally different. This one is a car I've never seen before. This is the 1955 Rover T3 gas turbine base unit mule, which is what became this, the actually dressed up looking nice T3. There had previously been the Jet 1, which is the first jet car, which is currently in the Science Museum rather than here. But this was, as the name suggests, the third turbine car. And this being the uh, test mule was a, a prototype for how to make the thing fit together. So you can see there's wood in the construction, just basic folded plastic. Uh, I, said, that's, I thought it was aluminium, that's more wood. So this is a layout plan for how they're going to build the car. The jet turbine is in the rear. This thing actually has four wheel drive and inboard brakes. You can certainly see some of what became the Rover 2000 in this. Fascinating car. So we've got a cooler at the front with what looks like domestic plumbing running to it. Uh, electrical systems for the battery which are sat here in the front as well. Here we have the fuel tank here in the front. Very Land Rover prototype like here at the begin around the windscreen with this perspex and just bent plastic. Quite nice seats though considering it's basically a prototype test mule. And this dashboard, you can see these dials and instruments are straight out of the Rover factory, apart from the one that says jet temperature going up to 800 degrees and RPM going to 60,000. Yeah, the running speed of this engine was actually 52,000 RPM, which is a little bit more than your average Rover four cylinder. This is very interesting because we've got so many completely bespoke parts for this car. But this is purely, as I say, a test mule for what was going to become, well, what was still a test mule in a way, but more of a semi-production ready thing. This is the actual T3, which like the mule next to it, is four wheel drive. It is rear engined, but it is a proper car with a proper dashboard and proper interior mostly. Now on this one, it's very, very basic. You can see the aluminium chassis legs. You can see this one real 1950s parts. I love the 1950s fire extinguisher over there as well. The wiring, everything is exposed because it's a, a factory, a factory mule. But this one, the actual T3, is a very pretty car. You can see this going into production as a regular piston engine Rover. The gas turbine coupe. So it has a twin shaft turbine, 100 mile an hour top speed, 110 horsepower. No price quoted because, well, it never made it into production. But really, really pretty car. We can go inside and have a little look if we like. It is very, very 1950s in here. Oh, smell the leather and the carpet. This little gear shift is absolutely fascinating. It's just got reverse and forward on it. Not exactly an automatic, it's like an electric car with a, just a direct drive system. Industrial pyrometer, I'm not quite sure what that measures. I'm sure someone can tell me in the comments, but like the Mule, we have got our jet temperature up to 800 degrees. We've now got a 70,000 RPM uh, rev counter on there. Our speedometer going up to 120 and 
probably from a Rover P5. The general purpose dial. Also, we have, like in the P5, our bank of switches for other controls down the side. And we've got the standard ones. And we have a very recognizable Rover steering wheel. Oh, it's amazing being in this. We do have safety belts, of course. And we even have, in 1955, three-point harnesses because this thing was a, perhaps a little bit unpredictable with that jet turbine in the back just there. We have reopening quarter lights, that's cool. Now I've never been inside these cars before, this is a real treat. But things moved on from here because as I said, this did foreshadow the Rover 2000 with its inboard brakes. However, when the P6 did come out, there was something quite a lot more impressive. The T4, the fourth generation of the turbine cars. The gas turbine saloon. So we've gone from a two-seater, two-door coupe to an actual four-door saloon that could have been the family car. So this came out in 1961, just two years before the Rover P6 that it was based on. It was built around a P6 prototype. And you can see, well, obviously around the back of the car, you can see the very, very heavy, ro heavy Rover P6 influences, but around the front, it's a little bit like some of the styling bucks and prototypes that did come out earlier in the P6 development process. As uh, David Beish had had plans for a Citroen DS style front end sweeping down for aerodynamics, but the cooling just wasn't quite there. This though, Rover thought they could have on the market for three to four thousand pounds and on sale within about four years, given the go ahead. Now under the bonnet, Unlike the previous one, this is a front engine car. It's got a 2S140 turbine, which drives the front wheels, the rear suspension being just holding the back of the car off the ground in many ways. It runs on kerosene and gets approximately 15 to 20 miles to the gallon. They did do a lot of mileage prototyping these cars and drove them very, very, very long way to try and make it into a thing that could have gone into production. The thing is though, that £4,000 price tag was more or less double the cost of a regular P6, which weighed in about £1,900. Now bear in mind this is a prototype, so they've made distinct changes to the regular P6, which wasn't even on the market yet, so these seats are a flatter, wider, interestingly sculpted compared to the standard P6 seats, which were more like a horseshoe bucket style, which have this same nice uh, textured aluminium which we have in the cabin of the P6 on the, the door sills and so forth. But we have got a Rover 2000 steering wheel with a unique, well, covered over centerpiece. We have this quite a cool pod style dashboard. It's almost like a prototype Range Rover as well. So we've got our MPH reading up to 120 miles an hour. I guess it hits around 100 miles an hour probably, as did the coupe. We've got our RPM, same as in the uh, T3, going up to 70,000 RPM on the turbine. We've got the same knee bins as the P6. So you can see this was so closely related to the uh, production car. Then we have this really cool ventilation here in the center. I do quite like this actually. Whereas on the regular P6, we've got like a cowl across the top of the dashboard. Um, this one hasn't, it's completely open. Uh, this one's got a Smith's clock. The P6 2000 has got a Keenzel clock, which is the only unreliable thing in the car. Interestingly, because this is a prototype, we've got a second set of dials, which I guess the prototype test drive passenger would have been keeping an eye on for fuel, amps, oil, and jet temperature, again, up to 800 degrees centigrade. And then a few more controls and dials, which regular drivers would not be used to. But perhaps this is because it's a prototype. We have got our pressure gauge going up to 60 pounds per square inch. I'm not quite sure where in the system that's measuring. Uh, timer for minutes. I'm guessing this is all for uh, prototyping testing information because the average driver isn't going to need this kind of stuff. Now, I don't think this car has been running a while because it's a jet turbine. The kind of safety checking you need for a jet turbine is quite intense and the chance of blowing the thing up is also pretty high. This is absolutely fascinating to be inside and seeing close up all the little facets and details of this car. These are older Rover hubcaps, but on this style, actually make it look a little bit space age, like moon discs or something. And you'll notice this lip on the boot, which I think was another pro prototyping pre-production idea that Rover had had 
for the general production P6, which obviously went by the way and just had the nice smooth one in the end with the originally Rover script along here. So this is absolutely fantastic. And finally, at the same time, Rover were tied up with BRM to go racing to prove the, the uh, reliability of the gas turbine in the public's eye before any kind of production car happened. In 1963 through to 1965, they went to Le Mans, endurance racing, and they did quite well as well. This has got some real pedigree and heritage. Jackie Stewart drove this car really rather well. So this is the car that's most known in public. This is the car that was based around a BRM Grand Prix car chassis supplied by Richie Ginther, which had been crashed at Monaco in 1962. Then initially in 1963, Richie Ginther and Graham Hill drove the car, and later on in 1965, Jackie Stewart. After testing the car at Myra, Hill described the experience as well. You're sitting in this thing which you might call a motor car, and the next minute it sounds like you've got a Boeing 707 just behind you, about to suck you up and devour you like an enormous monster. I can imagine that being quite off-putting until you're used to it. And because it required special permission from the organisers, it was raced without a number. It just had the number 00 on the bonnet, but it came in eighth and gained a special prize for the first gas tyre at Boeing ever to complete the, the event. The next year, in 1964, a new coupe body was fitted. William Towns designed that one, quite a bit different from his later, more angular work. Then the engine was modified and gained a heat exchanger and ceramic discs as part of it, which came from a company called Corning in America. 1965 was the last year it ran in Le Mans, this time with Graham Hill and Jackie Stewart, and it ran in a two litre class this time, instead of its own unique one. It did have some overheating problems and some damage to the turbine blades from debris but it survived the 24 hours and averaged a speed of 98.8 miles an hour and came in 10th, the highest place for any British car. So this is a Rover gas turbine, a Type 1560. Not quite sure which cars that would have gone into. But you can see how compact it is, how small. The unit itself was absolutely tiny. Obviously the uh, heat exchangers and so forth to make the thing work will have taken a lot more space. So this was a fascinating chapter in the history of the British motor industry and perhaps yet another lost opportunity. Who knows, had Rover pushed this a bit further, maybe we could all be driving jet cars today and maybe instead of electric cars, we'd be driving jet turbines running on who knows what instead, maybe flying cars. Anyway, thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed. If you have, please hit like and subscribe and join us again next time. Well, who knows what we're doing. Probably not check cars though.